Welcome to the final part of Lecture 3. The topic that I'd like to cover now is how to write a very simple reactor model for a plug flow re reactor in MATLAB. The same approach can also be used in Python, Octave, or a number of other programming languages. I've purposefully idealized the chemistry and heat transfer involved in this example, but adding extra complexity to this example is relatively straightforward to do. We'll talk through how to set up the kinetics, how to set up the heat transfer, and then we'll look at how to code the problem. We'll end by looking at the results from the model and by discussing a few cautionary notes that must be taken into account when writing your own modeling code. So here on my whiteboard is a schematic diagram of a section through a tubular reactor. What we have is a non-isothermal tubular reactor, and we're going to assume that we have zero radial temperature gradient. As a note, we could also use the approach we're going to develop here to model a batch reactor. Rather than looking at a volume slice, we'd just be looking at the time slice at fixed volume. But hopefully that will become apparent as we go on through this example. So if we think about our volumetric slice, coming into our volumetric slice, we have a volumetric flow of species. And my species that we're going to have are A, B, C and D. It's very much an engineer's sketch of a reactor. Within this volumetric slice, we've got some conversion going on. A plus B gets converted to our desired product D and it gets converted according to K1. Our desired product D, unfortunately, reacts with our reactant A to produce an undesired product C, a byproduct, and that goes with rate K2. So coming out of a volumetric slice, we have our volumetric flow rates of species A, B, C, and D changed by a small amount, which is DQ of A, B, C, and D. So the first thing we're going to do is to write down the rate equations for each of the species. If we consider species A, we can see that species A is consumed in reaction 1 and reaction 2. And so the rate of consumption is going to be minus K1A times B minus K2A times D squared. D squared because we've got one mole of A reacting with two moles of D since there's only so there's only a one pre-multiplying K2, but of course it's D plus D plus A, so it should be A times D times D in the rate equation. If we look at the rate of consumption of B, we can see that B is only consumed in reaction 1, and the rate of consumption here is simply going to be minus K1A times B. Let's look at the rate of production of our byproduct C. C is only produced in the second equation, and so we've got the rate of production of C, RC, is going to be K2A times D squared. If we look at the rate of consumption of D, well, we have a balance between consumption and production. So D is produced in reaction 1 and consumed in reaction 2. And so the first term in that rate equation corresponds to the production, K1A times B, and the second term corresponds to the consumption, minus 2 k 2 a times d squared because there's twice as much d being consumed as there is a. So here are the four rate equations that correspond to my simplified chemistry. What I'd like to do now is to convert these rate equations into ordinary differential equations and in order to do that we need to try and tie together the characteristics of the chemical reactor in this case, case a steady state plug flow reactor with the kinetics of the reaction and if we think about what that link looks like for a plug flow reactor, we know that d by dv multiplied by the concentration of species is going to be my rate equation Ra divided by q. And so for species A, the concentration of A by dv is going to be Ra over q. And we can take the rate equations that we derived previously and just substitute them into this form. And so there I've put those on the whiteboard for you dA by dV, dB by dV, dC by dV, and dD by dV. As a reminder, Q here is my volumetric flow rate, and V is the volume of my reactor element. And just as a note, my reactor has an internal diameter, D, which we will be using very shortly. If we think how we would go about solving these differential equations, we'll see that we need some information to do it. This is what we term an initial value problem. In order to solve these equations, we need to know what the concentration of A, B, C, and D is coming into our volume element. If we imagine our plug flow reactor as being made as a series of volume elements, then what we need to know is the feed concentration of A, B, C, and D 
entering that reactor. Okay, so let's now think about the heat transfer situation. Here on the whiteboard, again, is a sketch of the heat transfer. We have an incoming enthalpy flux. We have a mass flow rate, m dot. As, as long as we've got no other feeds or no other uh, ways in which we can draw products off, m dot should be constant by mass conservation. So m dot cpt, my incoming enthalpy flux, is going to be added to or subtracted to by whatever heat is being given off by my reactions. And so we have all my reactions going on in this volume. Each of those reactions has a reaction enthalpy. And so there's going to be a heat generation or consumption that is going to be the product of the reaction enthalpy multiplied by the reaction rate for each species. We'll sum all those reaction enthalpies up and then multiply by dV. Which means that I have an outgoing enthalpy flux which is different from my incoming enthalpy flux. So we've got m dot cp t plus dt. So we're acknowledging that temperature is going to change. Now of course what we could also have is heat transfer to and from the surroundings. And so if we think of this as a tube and if we think of this tube being a hot tube in a cold environment we can see that heat would leave according to some heat transfer coefficient u, some temperature driving force T, which is the temperature of this element, minus T infinity, and T infinity would be the ambient temperature. And that heat flux has to go through an area which is going to be the circumferential area of this tube, dA. So what we can do is we can write our energy balance down. We can say m dot Cp dt is going to be equal to the sum of the heat produced by the reaction, so that's minus sum delta HIRI times dV minus the heat conducted away in this case from in the reactor into the ambient surroundings. Okay, so what we need to do now is to think about how to write this slightly more easily because we've got dt, dv and dA, those two geometric terms, but of course the geometric term dv and the geometric term dA are linked by the reactor diameter. So what we can do is take our terms involving our volume element and our area element and write them both with respect to length. If we examine the volume element to start with, we can see that dv is simply pi d squared over 4 dl, where dl is the length of the element we're looking at and d is a diameter. Likewise, we can say that my area element, dA, is simply going to be pi times d dl because it's the circumferential area. So pi d being the circumference, dl again being the length of the element. <laughs> which means that we can write a differential equation for temperature now as a function of length. So dt by dl is going to be equal to the group of terms that I've written on the board here. Now, what we need to do is have all our ordinary differential equations with respect to the same parameter. If we think back to our reaction ordinary differential equations, we had d by dv of concentration of species. And so what we're going to do is convert all of those to being d by dl, such that we're looking at the same variation of each of the ODEs. So here on the board is the final set of ordinary differential equations I'm going to be solving. Note that everything is respect to d, to d length. So we've got d concentration of a by dl, and the same for all the other concentration of species, and dt by dl. So what we need to do now is to figure out a way in which we can easily solve these sets of equations. And one way of doing this is to define a vector, what I'm going to call a state vector, S, which contains everything in terms of information that we need to solve. And then we're going to just solve that vector as a function of length. And so in this case, my state vector S is going to take five terms. It's going to take the concentration of species A, concentration of species B, concentration of species C and D, and temperature. And so what we'll do is then use one of the inbuilt solvers within MATLAB to solve the evolution of this vector S. So here on the board is a set of code. Now feel free to pause the video and read through the code. I've commented the code um, hopefully as clear as possible and you'll see that the code is broken up on this slide into three chunks. We've got the bit of code that sets up the problem. All the comments are in green. And so here we're defining the vector initial conditions. My initial state vector S0 
and the total amount of length that we wish to solve for for the plug flow reactor and what we do is to give various numerical values to these initial conditions. Then we're defining the vector of pre arrhenius coefficients for reaction rates, then we're defining the heats of reaction, and then we're defining one or two other physical properties, for example heat transfer coefficients and heat capacities. Then the next section of code solves the problem. What this actually does is call a subroutine, which we'll have a look at on the next slide, but that subroutine is being called by an ODE solver. Within MATLAB, I've elected to choose ODE15S, which is an ordinary differential equation solver for stiff systems. And we'll talk about stiffness in a minute. What I then do is have a section of code that plots out the results in a human readable format. So we get some nice graphs that have got labels on the x-axis and y-axis, so we can see the, the variation of temperature and the variation of species. And if we look at the amount of comment on this screen compared to the amount of code on this screen, the comment outweighs the code by about two to one. So there really is precious little computer code here to write. The important thing we now need to look at is what that subroutine is that is called by the ODE solver, because it is within that subroutine that you have the statements of chemical rate. And so here on the board we have that subroutine. And remember that my state vector S contains five elements. So the first element is concentration of species A, the second element is B, third element is C, fourth element is D, and the fifth element is of course temperature. And so what I've done on the board here is to write out what each of those positions in the state vector are, are equal to in terms of the equations that govern them. So for example ds brackets 1 would be the equation that governs the rate of reaction for species A, so that would effectively be dA by dL. And we can see that I've got some terms here that I've um, derived. We've got area as a group term that we can use. And we've got the various other parameters that are needed by these um, equations being part of the information that is received by the subroutine when it is called. OK, so if you were to transcribe that code into MATLAB and run it, this is what you'd get. You'd get two graphs. You'd get a graph which is a concentration of species as a function of length and you get the graph of temperature as a function of length. And so we've got some chemical reactions, we've got some heat transfer conditions, and we've written a model very, very quickly to figure out what the conversion profiles look like. It was a simple model. We solved it, we wrote this in under 20 lines of code. We'd made some assumptions. We said that we've only got axial temperature gradients, that our reactions, however, were nonlinear, and we had sequential byproduct formation. We had heat generation, it was an exothermic reaction, and also we had heat exchange with the environment as well. So we could, of course, add extra degrees of complexity on this in terms of the kinetics and in terms of the heat transfer scenarios. And if we think about that statement that we made when we started this um, part of this lecture, which was we could also use this for a batch system as a function of time, remember when we discretized our um, chemical rates and our energy transfer is with, with respect to length. We had dt by dl and dA by dl. Of course, there's no reason for a batch system why we just couldn't have a slightly different link between the characteristics of the reactor with respect to time now and the kinetics of the reaction and end up with a set of ordinary differential equations with respect to time. So you can have a look at how the species concentration evolves and the temperature may evolve as a function of batch time. And of course, if you wanted to complicate it further, if you're doing a batch reaction and you had a control system in there which said, OK, if the temperature exceeds a certain temperature, I'm going to switch on heat transfer, which means I change a heat transfer coefficient from zero through to, say, a few hundred watts per square meter Kelvin by using some flow control like an if statement, then you can do that as well within that subroutine that contains the equations that you're solving for your chemical reactor. The ODE solvers don't like it when that happens because it makes it exceptionally stiff, but they're so robustly written that they cope. OK, so a few words of caution. I've mentioned the phrase stiff systems quite a few times, and what I mean by that is when we've got systems that have both very fast and very slow rates together. So stiff systems have particular solvers that apply to them, and in MATLAB ODE15S is an example of a stiff system solver. Be aware of the impact of numerical error. 
The key thing to check this is if you're modeling your reactor, you should know by the end of that reactor what to expect. Always go into solving a problem, in effect, knowing part of the answer. And so you should know what the steady state of your reactor is. Do you achieve that steady state at the end of your profiles? If you do, then the profiles may be correct. If you don't, you know they're not correct. Don't assume computer code you write is correct first time around. Check it and check it carefully. So, for example, switch reactions on and off with and without heat generation and just make sure the mass balances and the energy balances actually add up. Test the heat transfer in the reaction in, in the reactor, sorry, in the absence of reaction and see if the energy balance adds up. Try each reaction in the absence of heat transfer, but with the exotherm and the endotherm enabled and make sure that's sensible. And then start to couple physical phenomena again. So always check your computer code. Know what the answer should be. Know what that steady state should be. And have a look at all the different effects and make sure that you've got some back of the envelope calculation that you can compare them to. So a few key points. With little knowledge and some programming, it's fairly straightforward to write your own reactor models. It can be a useful approach if the type of kinetic expression that governs the reaction you're modeling isn't included in standard process simulation software. And it can be a useful approach if you're trying to model something that isn't included as a unit operation in standard process simulation software, like in some systems, a batch case. It can also be useful to do this if the process simulation struggles with especially stiff kinetics. I've had this problem a few times before where I've had incredibly stiff kinetics that a process simulator struggles with, but an, an industrial solver such as MATLAB can work. But don't forget to check your code. Don't forget to have an idea of what it should be predicting and have a look and make sure that it's doing it sensibly.